Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to the McMichael Symposium for Painting Canada, Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven. Le Canada en peinture, Tom Thompson et le groupe de sept, c'est le symposium aujourd'hui. I'm Victoria Dickinson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of the Museum. And it's my privilege and an honor to welcome you all here today. We are so excited about the exhibition, Painting Canada, and you'll have a chance to see it if you haven't seen it already. But it's wonderful as well to be able to invite here speakers from Canada and Europe who've joined us to talk about Tom Thompson and Painting Canada and the Group of Seven. So this is a, going to be a great day, and it's a wonderful opportunity to start thinking about our own art, the art that's produced in this country, thinking about it from many points of view, and you're going to hear a lot of perspectives on the Group of Seven and on Canadian art today. First of all, I'd like, however, to welcome the representative of our, ex of our symposium and exhibition patron, the A.K. Prakash Foundation, Dr. Michael Weinberg, to say a few words on behalf of the foundation. Um, good morning, esteemed faculty, uh, Victoria and Katerina, ladies and gentlemen. As a trustee of the A.K. Prakash Foundation, it's a pleasure to welcome you and to be able to sponsor this significant and wonderful event. The AK Prakash Foundation is a new foundation. It has a dual mandate, on one hand medicine, on one hand art. In art, we're here to promote historical Canadian art, and on the medical side, we're looking to educate physicians from underprivileged countries. What we're looking for in our foundation is to have a ripple effect. So we're looking not only to fund one event, but to continue to fund other events and to fund events like this where people will take things away with them and that will encourage more learning and more investment in historical Canadian art. On the medical side, uh, in July of 2013, we have an awesome reconstructive plastic surgeon coming from Zimbabwe. She's an MD, PhD, fluent in Shona, English, uh, and Japanese because she did her uh, PhD in Japan. She'll go back and do burn care, cleft lip care, and teach at the university there. In July or August, we're also having a physician coming from Addis Ababa. She's a, uh, probably a, a general surgeon doing pediatric general surgery. In, uh, we have an alliance, an alliance through University of Toronto with um, Ethiopia, the university in Addis Ababa. Addis, uh, Ethiopia has 90 million people of which 60% roughly are under the age of 16. They have three surgeons there. So by us adding a pediatric general surgeon and sending uh, young surgeons from here to train with that surgeon when they're uh, up and running uh, increases their capacity by 25%. We hope to get a neurosurgeon and we also hope um, to get another pediatric plastic surgeon. So that'll be a magnificent and significant change to their capacity in that country. On the art side, I guess we're here for the arts. I guess got carried away with the medicine part. Um, <laughs> um, Painting Canada and this symposium are only the first of two of many to follow sponsorships from this uh, foundation. If anybody knows Ash uh, Prakash, he's a very passionate person, specifically passionate about Canadian art, specifically passionate about improving medicine in underprivileged countries. So we take this opportunity uh, to share our commitment with you, to invite you to uh, we invite and challenge you, I should say, to come along with us. It's an open foundation, so if you want to join us for this wonderful ride, we'd love to have you along, and we're going to be out there doing it, not just talking about it. I hope you have a wonderful and excellent day. Thank you, Michael, and thanks again to the A.K. Prakash Foundation. This is so exciting for us to have this kind of support to look at Canadian art. I'm Joyce Siemens. I'm an art historian, and I teach at York. Um, it's, oh, great. That's even better than you have yours. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Do you have to turn it on? Thank you, Ann. It is on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have three panelists today who will be engaged in a discussion. Each of them is a curator of this exhibition, and I am particularly looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, in, I haven't seen the exhibition yet, 
but I'm quite familiar with its contents, and I have had the opportunity to um, have a look at the catalog, and I am really, really looking forward to seeing the show. So I would like first to introduce Katerina, Katerina At At Atanos. Nasova, sorry, I, I had it right and I do it yeah. wrong every time. Okay. Um, Katerina is the uh, chief curator here and she is the person who has been most deeply engaged with the exhibition through um, the McMichael connection. She has studied uh, in, the, uh, in Eastern Europe, and she has studied at the University of Toronto um, in the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies, a great preparation for coming to <laughs> the group of seven. Um, but as you will see, um, her, uh, her um, major initial work uh, in Canadian art history was at the Varley Gallery, where she did a remarkable job in drawing the attention of the public to the work of Varley, but to uh, the group of seven. Sorry, to thank you for making that point. It often happens to me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Okay, I'll talk right into the mic. So we're very pleased to have Katerina here. Each of our panelists has had um, a deep exposure to Canadian art history. Anna Hudson, in the middle, is. Um, a colleague whom I have worked with over a number of years. Her background is um, in uh, Canadian art history as well. She was the Associate Curator of Canadian Art at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and in that capacity, she and I work closely together. She has worked on a variety of exhibitions related to the group at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and uh, she has been part of this curatorial team. I would also like to introduce Ian Dujardin, who is a Scot with a French-sounding <laughs> origin name, a uh, name of, of French origin, but Scotified, and who has, at the Dulwich Gallery in London, been, or in Dulwich, been very much responsible for making this exhibition a reality. And I have to say that my questions of our panelists um, is to uh, try and examine how the exhibition came to be, why this exhibition now, and what the particular characteristics of this exhibition are, particularly in the context of the fact that the show is here now, but was shown in several European venues, and I hope Marietta, whom I haven't met yet. Marietta, can you raise your hand? Hi, Marietta, I'm gonna call on you in a few minutes, just to ask one question that I'm gonna ask of all the panelists about the exhibitions, but I'd like to know more about the Gruniger experience. Um, and so my interest is in examining what is unique about this exhibition, why this exhibition now, uh, the particular relationship of this work, and I'm going to come back to this uh, later within the uh, context of the 1924 exhibition, which you speak of in the catalog and which obviously influenced you, and with respect to an exhibition that some of you may have seen at the National Gallery called Terre Sauvage, which was a 19... Uh, turn of the century, 1999 to 2001 exhibition that also traveled to Mexico City, to four venues in China, and to uh, Lillehammer in Norway, so another Norwegian venue um, to Sweden and to Copenhagen. So my question is, you know, when you were, again, this is a contextual ex uh, question, when you were creating this exhibition, how much were you influenced by the um, experience of those other exhibitions, their reception in Europe? But that, let's hold that thought, and that's the larger context. Uh, my first question, and I have to find my first question, is, just one second, um, on the curatorial premises of this show, Ian, what was the impact on the development of this exhibition 
of the British eye. So this comes back to this context. What is different about this show when we look at it from your perspective and when you were involved in the selection of the work, deeply involved? Yeah. Um, now, let's just check. Can you, can you all hear me or do I have to lean forward? I'll do better. <laughs> can I take it out? There you go. Um, I'm too tall. <laughs> Still getting away from it. Um, in putting together the, the, the show, um, can you just repeat the question for me because I want to get it right? Uh, um, of your perspective, the British perspective, or perhaps the Scottish I, perspective. Yeah, I, I think, sorry, <laughs> having asked you to repeat it, I didn't interrupt you. Um, <laughs> The British perspective, in a funny kind of way, I'm not the right person to answer that, that question because uh, obviously um, Canadians will see it perhaps differently and you might see uh, in the exhibition, you might see things that you didn't expect to see and I think that would be, that would be the indicator of, of the British eye. But I know that I came to the, the show, um, and I don't want to impinge on your first bigger question, but uh, through simply being a, a great fan of the art, a real enthusiast uh, for painting Canada, whether the, for, for, for the painting Canada, but if, if, if there was any influence on, on the choice and the selection, um, I think uh, the British eye uh, would be influenced by the fact that actually between 1912 and 1932, which is roughly the areas that we're talking about, um, in England, there is a great love of landscape, yes, but there is very little, I think, in terms of the post-impressionist influence on landscape. We have, uh, say, Roger Fry um, and Vanessa Bell, um, both of them quite bad artists. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I just dismissed Bloomsbury in one sentence. There you go. I hate them both. Um, and, and there really is, um, I'm not a dogmatic person at all, I'm sorry, uh, there really is, is, is nothing there. There is nothing there that compares with the richness of the landscape tradition here in Canada in those particular dates. So funnily enough, there's a gap in England. Now in, in England, um, the, the English love landscape, yes, uh, but of course we tend to go back to Turner, Constable, um, the golden age of British watercolour around the beginning of the 19th century. So I think our, our love of landscape doesn't take off again until Paul Nash, who comes in a bit later, and then you have the surrealist uh, influence. And so there's, there's a gap. Now, as a Scot, you'll notice I'm very careful with my Englishes and my Scottishes. Um, as a Scot, on the other hand, we have the Scottish colourists. Mm -hmm. And when you look at them, um, cattle, people like that, uh, they are very much post-impressionist. They have this bright color, the, the extraordinary painterliness of their, of their work. And there is a definite, there's a definite um, chime with Canadian art. So I think, uh, just to try and pull all this together to actually answer your question, um, there is, uh, I think, an element of the British eye seeing things in Canadian art that are sort of familiar, but this huge gap in the English um, vision of landscape in that period means that for a British audience, and I, I put together exhibitions all the, you know, I'd done it for 25 years, I knew that a British audience would fall in love with this work. Well, I didn't know it, but it, I would have disowned them if they hadn't. Katerina, how does the show that we will see downstairs in a few minutes differ from the show that was in London? Well, I think, welcome everyone. <clears throat> I think uh, the, uh, the interesting challenge for, for all of us, and I speak for Mariette as well, is how we as curators saw that um, selection of works and how we approach the hanging or the interpretation of all the works of art in a different narrative for each and different institution. And I had that um, an interesting challenge for myself as we were bringing the show back in Canada. It's our patrimony, it's our um, familiarity with the works and also our critical eye as to how we hang yet another show of the Group of Seven and here at McMichael where we actually have so many of those. Um, so I was very mindful of all those challenges and um, 
uh, I greatly appreciated what Ian uh, and his staff did in Dulwich, and I also visited uh, Marietta in uh, Groningen in the uh, early September. And I must say each and every curator um, interpreted the show differently and in a wonderful way. And um, every time I went and sold the exact same works, it was different. Uh, but for McMichael, um, I had to answer different questions. So it was important um, to, without being chronological, without being even thematic, uh, without following uh, the same logic, philosophy, and expectation that we have in Canada for five, six decades um, towards Tom Thompson, the group of seven, to create an exciting, different, fresh look on the, uh, the works uh, and on the artists. So um, what you will see down is a, a little enhanced and uh, differently interpreted hanging uh, with the inclusion of a lot of archival material with a lot of material objects that belong to the artist. Um, the voices of the artist, uh, quotes from their uh, correspondences, their writings, their interviews, their poetry, uh, writings that enhance the voice of the artist and the feel for the nature, for the site where they worked. Uh, and nine new loans, uh, which uh, uh, my co-curators graciously agree that I would need to expand um, because I'd like to retain the, um, the British approach, if I may say, or Scottish-British approach, I should say. Um, so uh, the first room uh, Ian approached as being entirely Tom Thompson, and the last room was Lauren Harris. And in order for me to uh, follow that with different architecturally different different spaces, is I pulled the last um, 1917 Thompsons, and I almost created a memorial wall of the last Thompson spring mm -hmm. uh, for us in a different space. So in Gallery 1, it's only 1915. 1916 um, uh, major works and uh, canvas and sketch together. And in the last room of Harris, I needed more uh, um, Arctic uh, canvases and sketches by Harris in order to bring that very forceful and very powerful uh, conclusion, almost a shrine look like uh, uh, experience and sensation of where Harris went. Uh, I think it would be for us or for me to put uh, early Lake Superior sketches and canvases next to the uh, Arctic a little bit uh, too risky. So I had to go a little bit in terms of chronology to uh, present Harris in a better light. But uh, I hope that answers. Mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, of course, one of the, one of the great differences, um, just to elaborate on what I was saying earlier, um, of, of a Brit organizing um, a show on, on, on Canadian art is that uh, for my audience, there's no baggage at all. Um, from the point of view of, of putting on an exhibition, this is a good thing. No baggage is good. It means you have to really boil it down to tell the, st the, t to tell the story. And so uh, you can imagine for, for, for Katerina the questions about, you know, what do the artists say what, to hear their voice. At Dulwich, um, the first question is not what is the artist's voice, it's who is the artist. Mm -hmm. It was as simple as that. Not a single one of the artists in this show was known to a British audience at all. And so um, my, my uh, task was very, very different. I had to introduce um, artists in a way that, that made them stick in the memory, but didn't um, involve chronology. Nobody in England was going to care um, who came first, how, you know, whether MacDonald had been, had been ahead of the game in 1909 or, or whatever, because they, it just, they didn't know who we were talking about. So in, in many ways, my presentation had to be quite simple. And if there was a hidden agenda there, um, it was uh, the introduction of Tom Thompson, um, really putting him forward because he was such an astonishing genius, and I think that would work on, on global terms. But also I had to do it as a very simple journey, and so I interpreted the journey as a journey between Tom Thompson and Lauren Harris. It's a kind of spiritual but also geographical journey because that's the other thing in England uh, a casual reference to Algoma is going to get you nowhere. <laughs> I needed maps. So it, it, it's a very different challenge. Can I, That's can very I, evident in the catalogue as well, yes. How much, Ian, did you worry about uh, your audience saying, oh, I've seen that before, or is that derivative of a, of a British artist that they already knew? Was that something you worried about? No, I, I didn't. Um, 
I don't think there was any concern about uh, uh, a British audience coming to it. It's kind of what I said earlier in the sense that there's really nothing in Britain to, to really compare. Uh, a very educated audience would mentally, I'm sure, be ringing chimes with um, Augustus John and Dixon Innes and Derwent Lees, but then uh, they were painting around 1911 in Wales, and the results of their work is very, very similar in many ways to what um, Tom Thompson was doing at the same time. But actually, Augustus John is wildly out of fashion in England mm. at the moment. Not, people aren't really aware of his work. They're far more interested in Gwen, uh, his sister. Uh, yeah, he's, he's deeply unfashionable. Mm -hmm. So I don't think people were picking up on that at all. <laughs> And funnily enough, the, the, the frame of reference, I think, for, for um, the group of seven was actually more European, and so Marietta will be filling us in on, on that, um, but, you know, on the broadest possible way, if you, were, if you were being utterly simplistic and talky in sound bites, which, of course, I never do, except to the press. Um, talking to the press, you know, you would, you would say, you know, Tom Thompson is, is Canada's Van Gogh, you know, and you'd kind of blush as you did it, but nonetheless that was probably the reference um, to, to the post-impressionist that people wanted to hear. Uh, it, when you've got a poster like Tom Thompson's The Jack Pine, um, it sort of says it all, it's the best poster I've ever, ever produced at Dulwich Picture Gallery. <laughs> Katerina, you wanted to add something? Well, I, I think Ian uh, brought that uh, issue because I would like to um, hear Marietta's comment because uh, her interpretation of the show was uh, quite significantly different. But what I was impressed is to see how she curated a complementary side of her own artist, the plug oh. uh, group, and how the links work really in an amazing way uh, visually. Well, that, that's very interesting because I wanted to... Um, I, well, we'll go to Marietta now. If you're comfortable coming up here... Um, because my next question, I had one in between which I'll come back to, was that when the 1999 show was installed in Mexico, there was a Mexican nationalist show that was installed at the, pair at the same time. And it really enhanced uh, the audiences who knew nothing about Canadian art as yours mm -hmm. did not, their understanding of the difference between you know, the folk narrative and the dramatic nationalist school, the stylistic similarities in some respects and differences in others. And so I wondered whether or not you, or you, and I think, or the Norwegian um, exhibition had looked to create a context within mm -hmm. the, um, y your own artistic um, environment and your collection or borrowed works when you installed the exhibition. So could you tell us a little bit about how you presented the show and what the response was? Um, the, let me first say that... that? Um, oh, you've got one. Yeah, I would like to sit there as well, but perhaps you can... Okay. Um, let me first tell you that I was interested in uh, the Group of Seven for about 10 years. That was where my idea started to bring this uh, group of very important painters also to the Netherlands. And in fact, it was a Canadian idea, idea because uh, 10 years ago I, had a, I have a, a, a friend in Canada, in Toronto, and I am curating in the Netherlands, in Groningen, Groningen Museum. And at that time, I was writing an article on uh, uh, one of the, the Plug, the Plow, an artist group in Groningen, and catalogued text, and I sent it to him. And he was reading it, and then he responded to me, well, that is very interesting. It reminds me of the group of seven. Have you ever heard about it? And that was where it all started. So there was, for me, a kind of direct link between an artist group in Holland and an artist group in uh, Canada I never heard of and I was an art historian, how come? So that was where the idea started and um, so um, it was almost a quest to bring this exhibition to Groningen but we succeed and it didn't uh, uh, stay a, a, a view from afar but it was really interesting to compare this unknown uh, beautiful landscape art with our own collection of landscape painting from the Proeg, 
from the same period. So that was what Katharina is referring about. It was quite interesting to see, and also the visitors in the Groningen Museum were, were very excited to see this combination. So it was very good. To and can you tell us? Can you all hear in the back? We're okay? Okay. Um, can you tell us what your observations were? You've written in the catalog a little bit about what the de Plug was and, and what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what the outcome was in your own mind as a curator looking at these works? What the outcome was? Uh, how you saw the group of seven. I mean, you brought them to see what the comparison was. Well, so yes. what was your impression? Yeah, well, my first impression, because we were not familiar with this group, so it's, it's, in a way it's good that you're not familiar, familiar because you have not all that baggage, because in Canada the group of seven is over-familiar, so you can look with, a, I hope, with fresh eyes. So I saw a kind of similarity, especially in color and, in, well, sometimes also technique with the expressionists, in uh, Holland and in Germany, and uh, especially um, because our the Plug artists were, uh, I will tell you later and this afternoon, uh, inspired by the expressionism. So I think um, what I see when I look at the Group of Seven is that, of course, I know eh, nature was their biggest teacher, and it was a very interesting culture. But of course, there was also the zeitgeist at that period. And one way or another, uh, men, artists, are influenced whether they say they are or they are not. And I think that is very interesting to, to, to see. Um, and of course, the, um, many paintings are more late impressionist, but there are traces of expressionism, in my opinion, in color, in technique as well. And I will later on point that out because that is of a special interest to me as a curator of expressionism, of course. So. May I ask you one more question in terms of that contextualization of the group and the mm -hmm. comparison with the um, Dutch groups? Did you look at all at the relationship between uh, Mondrian and uh, Harris in terms of an yeah, there, is an also, the... there are many different uh, views to look upon this art. Um, of course, Mondrian and theosophy is very interesting. And Harris uh, being in Berlin from 94 till 98 is a very interesting period, of course, and I don't know if there's uh, going on a lot of research in Canada about this period, but in that period there was uh, also Kandinsky uh, uh, on the verge of, of bringing, of writing his, uh, his famous book and his um, impact of uh, Kandinsky, of theosophy on many painters, of course, so I think there's much more to research, to do a lot of research, uh, especially also on Harris, who is a great painter. So, yeah. I, I, can I? Yeah. No, I, um, I, was I the only one who saw it in Oslo? I think I was, yes. Um, that, this was interesting in Oslo as well, because um, the curator there uh, brought in some works from the Scandinavian tradition, which of course is very strong and, and important in this case, because of course Harris and MacDonald um, visited the Scandinavian um, show in Buffalo in, in, in 1913, and so were actually definitely influenced. And to see works by Fjeisted and uh, Fjeisted probably pronunciation, yeah, Fjeisted, and Harold Solberg uh, within the show, or not quite hanging alongside, and early uh, and Munch as well, M Munch's landscapes, uh, Nikolai Astrup, people like that. Um, there was a definite. Um, um, uh, chiming there, they, 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 they hung very nicely together and the influence of course in this case was, was very strongly documented but I wonder in fact, uh, and I, I'm not sure what Marietta thinks about this, but there is a kind of very broad sort of northern um, uh, uh, tradition as it were of, of, of the way in which the lessons of expressionism and post-impressionism spread across the world. It seems to have spread up you know, north, as it were, mm. um, in a particular way. And I think probably, if you look in Russia, uh, Russia, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, um, and uh, all points north, you find something similar happening almost around the world at this time. 
So, so the Canadians are not, as I think they have been uh, posited in the past, they're not a kind of um, uh, Canada-specific uh, happening. Mm. Um, there's something happening globally, and the Canadians fit in rather well with all of that. Um, which is interesting. You, I think you think of it as a national thing, but it, maybe it's international. <laughs> and, and that's one of the questions, but it's interesting. Marietta, I won't keep you standing here, but I have one more quick question for you. I mean, in fact, what Ian is speaking about is the Canadians were responding to the Dutch and the uh, Anton Mauve and the whole issue of, you know, what was our national school? Yeah. So stylistically, you have post-impressionism, um, expressionism and the move towards abstraction. But in fact, you know, again, from a context perspective, the best thing you could really show um, in terms of how ca Canadian art evolved or what it, what it, it, what it responded to yeah. was the popularity of, of Hague, Dutch artists. Of Hague School. That's yes, not exactly. a very interesting uh, uh, field to explore, I think. And there was a tradition of Hague School uh, collecting in especially Montreal. And um, one of the curators of the National Gallery, Charlie Hill, uh, he lectured twice in Groningen, and he pointed also he pointed out uh, some of the paintings that were collected uh, in Canada. And uh, it's very interesting to know that one of these paintings, which is now on show in Groningen, was actually a painting from Matthias Maris in Canada and now in the collection of the Groningen Museum. You can look it up in, on our web website. But it is a very interesting uh, um, area to explore. There was a, a, a good um, catalog I read from Marta H. Erdelek, and she pointed out, this, uh, uh, pointed out the, the collecting in Canada of the Hague, of the Hague School. And, um, just recently, I read an article in a Dutch newspaper that there is a national gallery in Washington, which at this very moment is now collecting Hague School again. As I heard that in Canada, it was is now the case that the Hague School w w was sold because it was uh, the painters of the Group of Seven that were not very impressed by the Hague School. It wasn't uh, not only which not is, impressed, which, which is also an influence to react yes, against to exactly. is a very interesting exactly. influence. So. I was going to say it was a, a bete noir for them in terms of the popularity. So, yeah. so the Dutch connection yeah, is a is very a, interesting is a, is a very interesting yeah. connection, yes. Yeah. Well, Thank so. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mary. You're welcome. Yes, can I, I, yes go ahead. Sorry, I just want to make a quick point in that, in that context. Um, we are also not very much aware that our artists were very familiar with Dutch art. And in 1931, G.H. MacDonald actually delivered a very comprehensive lecture at the Art Gallery of Toronto at the time, speaking about Homer Choi and uh, Feistad and all of the artists that were part of that Albright Knox 1913 exhibition. A very, I had a transcript of that lecture when I was working on the essay uh, for this catalog, and I was really impressed of the sense of admiration and, and also understanding of where this, the northern Descan Scandinavian artists came from in terms of tradition. Uh, but also, um, I can resist pointing out that there is a great surprise for Marietta, especially for you downstairs. Uh, we have the original copy of the Scandinavian show catalog from 1913 that belonged to J.H. MacDonald. And uh, so I brought it up on display uh, next to uh, a very early Harris from 1913, uh, a snow scene that uh, is probably very reflective of what he saw when he visited with Harris that show in 1913. And the interesting part is even though the catalog is closed, it's not open, uh, for me was when I was paging through, is that the comments he made about the color, the composition, and everything was actually towards an artist, Anna Bomberg. Uh, contrary to what a lot of our esteemed scholars have been pointed about influence in Monk or Feistat, he was more fascinated with Anna Bomberg, um, Zart, uh, at that time during the exhibition. Thank you, for, thank you for that. I understand that that exhibition is going to be reconstructed, the 1912. It was in the Scandinavia House in New York it's last year. Oh, last okay. year. Oh, my God. I didn't know. Okay. Um, my next question is that this exhibition, when we're just different for the Canadian public in particular, um, draws on private collections and works that I understand have not been seen um, in, 
in the public eye, and you have juxtaposed some of those or integrated them into the exhibition. How does that experience of these new to our eyes um, uh, works uh, change our understanding of the work of the group or this exhibition vis-a-vis -vis perhaps, um, well, the, there were private, many private works in your collection and there are more as I understand it here. So could you speak to that? Um, well, I don't know how it, how, whether it changed anything particularly, but it was always part of the, the kind of curatorial brief. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started this process, I mean, it's, been, it's, a, it's a long, drawn-out process in some ways in that it's taken me, what, 25 years to actually get to this this point, but actually the exhibition came together relatively quickly at the end in the last two or three years. And um, part of the deal was, I mean, when I was talking to my advisors and an awful lot of people, including, I might add, Ash Prakash, who played a very important role in, in advising us all, I think, on, on, on putting together this, this exhibition, um, we thought, yes, we need the famous works, of course we do, and I, we were very um, lucky to get the, uh, the support of um, the McMichael and the National Gallery and the AGO who have all lent incredibly generously. But it was always part of the, um, the idea that th the difference with the show would be A, uh, myself, a, a, a British eye, um, uh, helping with the selection. But secondly, that we would always have a, we would have a very strong um, selection of private collection works that would be less familiar to a Canadian audience because we wanted um, the show not just to be a kind of revelation to European audiences but to have a value for Canadian audiences and at that time I think we, 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 we weren't um, by the time we were putting together the catalogue for instance um, the, uh, the show at the Mac McMichael was not on the cards at that point and so I mean, thanks to Victoria it's come back home but I um, it, we wanted the catalogue to be valid, uh, and for it to be valid, it had to have some surprises in it. Uh, just because the great enemy in Canada mm -hmm. for the Group of Seven is familiarity, over-familiarity uh, with the Group of Seven. I mean, what can, what can anyone tell you all about the Group of Seven? So we wanted to have something unfamiliar, just to make it valuable. Um, but uh, as for the, whether, whether uh, the unfamiliar work had an impact on how on how you see the group of seven, I think it can only be in the sense that um, it does pull the rug out from under over familiarity. Basically, if you, if you see that there is far more, because I think there is a canon, mm -hmm. is there not, a canon of group of seven paintings. Uh, the, the things that uh, you, you all as Canadians have grown up with on your schoolroom walls are the very famous ones, usually um, t tinging to sepia by the time you saw them as children. <laughs> um, so your, maybe some of your opinions of the Group of Seven was that they were basically painted in brown, whereas in fact <laughs> they were an anti... Uh, most of art history can, can, um, can be defined as brown and anti-brown, I, I think. Uh, Hague School brown, Group of Seven anti-brown. Um, but it, it did give you a, more of a sense of, of the colour and the range I think, and I think that's the important thing about the show. It does kind of bring things together that perhaps one hasn't seen together for a long time. You're very aware of the, the paintings individually in different museums, but bringing them together is very valuable and slightly different. Um, but the, the new stuff just shows you that there's a lot more out there. Now, they're far broader, far more extraordinary, far, far um, more beautiful, even than you knew. And I, I think we, we really enjoyed talking with one another uh, in looking at those sketches about what the choices were and that pattern and space come through in, in the sketches as, as profound aesthetic choices of what they experienced in nature and translating that experience. And one of the things, uh, sorry Joyce, you're probably, no, no, no. but one of the things that fascinated me, and this may be again something that is different with a, with a British eye, was the, the sense of process. Um, with, with the, the Canadian artists, because um, clearly the, the business of sketches, uh, the whole idea, the tradition of, of using small panels of, of wood um, is defined by the need to, to engage with the Canadian wilderness. Uh, you can't pack an easel into a canoe. And, you know, if you're going to be hiking, 
uh, you, you have to be able to carry things around, and the boxes that uh, Katerina has got out for this show are a very clear indicator of what artists had to do. It had to be quite precise and small uh, if you were going to head out into the wilderness. And so the sketch grows out of necessity. It's a canoe-driven idea. <laughs> and out of that necessity comes actually the most riveting and astonishing thing to a to a British eye about the group of seven, which is the vividness and speed of those sketches. If Thompson or MacDonald or Varley or any of these great sketch, sketches was producing three or four things a day, quite possibly, you're sitting there knee-deep in snow or knee-deep in black flies or whatever you're knee-deep in, but it's not, it's not comfortable, let's put it that way with a box on your knee, um, you want to produce things very fast. And so the spontaneity and speed and freshness of the sketches is what leaps out to a British audience. And this is one of perhaps the difference at Dulwich. At Dulwich, I had a wall three high of Tom Thompson's sketches. Now, I had a, a, a big event for the Royal Academicians, a great big dinner at the Royal Academicians at Dulwich Picture Gallery, reinventing a 19th century tradition we had there. And I'm just delighted to say that I found a group of Royal Academicians all riveted by Tom Thompson, as they were supposed to be. So our painters um, were firmly in front of Thompson. They'd never seen anything quite so extraordinary. Now, I'm not sure if that's something that um, a Canadian audience is quite aware of. I mean, you've become so aware of it. But the comparison between the sketch and the finished work was terribly important to this show. That sense of process of working out in nature and then going back to your shack. In the case of Tom Thompson, it's just down the road here, just down the path. Um, going back to a freezing cold shack in Toronto and working them up into finished paintings. It's a rather different relationship between the sketch and the final image, I think, and a very interesting one, very different from the European tradition of sketching. I'll be, I'll be the last to mention the bodies, but six of them are buried on our grounds. And I know I don't like that mentioning that, but um, listening to Ian, I thought, at least Varley's spirit will be very happy because towards the end of his life he wrote many letters and I'm familiar with uh, his position on that. He always regretted that he was never really welcomed and appreciated and recognized back home, back in England. So I think that goes back to saying, wow, thank you, Ian. <laughs> That's very interesting because the question that came out of hearing you speak from my perspective was, did you do anything to do the evolution of Varley you know, from Sheffield and the hills, you know, and rolling to, you know, the mountains of BC, northern Ontario, but particularly, you know, the mountains of BC, not just Lynn Valley, but the Table Mountain, etc. Well, actually, no, and I think it may have been, it may have been a missed opportunity. I mean, there is material um, in Sheffield, in the Sheffield archives, about, of course, L Lismer was there too, Lismer and Varley, both trained in Sheffield. Um, but not much that one could make use of. It's, it's, one of the, it's actually one of the most interesting things about the pair of them, I think, is that uh, they came over, um, as did so many, including apparently all of my great uncles, and my grandfather all came over um, to Canada. In, about this time, it was a common thing in, in Britain um, to come to Canada as a land of opportunity. But um, Lismer, certainly when he arrived, was painting like a British Impressionist. Uh, it, quite pretty, quite decorative, and as we know, he became this very strong graphic uh, artist, very powerful uh, lines, powerful colors. And it's very interesting, you can see in the photographs uh, that Katerina has put out in the, in the exhibition, um, that there are early photographs of, of, Var of um, uh, yeah, Varley and, and Lismer uh, joining Tom Thompson um, in Algonquin, and Tom Thompson was very much the guide. But, you know, my goodness, they've adopted the look, you know, the two cats. The... It's as if once, once they arrived, they became very Canadian indeed. And I don't think, as far as I'm aware, that Yorkshire is going to prepare you for Algonquin Park. <laughs> I think that's something else that uh, the three of us talked about a lot was what the relationship was between the three artists. And to imagine that some Lynn Valley works by Varley are actually very like McDonald works. I mean, that's, that's, we, were, 
we wouldn't have thought that before. So just having the chance to see those artists together and to make those connections uh, was was a huge element of our work together. And uh, uh, this this is one for Katerina as well. One of the things about Varley, it, it seems to me that Varley, some of the artists, you know, it's all quite um, consistent and you've got a kind of group of seven aesthetic, obviously. Um, but Varley always looks unique. And this is partly, I think, because he, he, went, he, he went out um, to, to Vancouver quite early on. But um, also, he, he was a highly sophisticated artist. And I think that was his art, art um, college training in Sheffield. I mean, Sheffield may seem like the back of beyond now. It's an industrial northern town. But it was actually quite, quite a hotbed of, of um, artistic uh, intent at that time. So it was a very good place to learn. And Varley, uh, it intrigues me, for instance, the, the I chose um, particularly the Vancouver mountain scenes uh, with Katerina's advice, of course, she's a great expert on Varley. But I particularly chose them, and even at the time, I was thinking to myself, this looks so like Ferdinand Hodler, the Swiss artist. And I can't believe that he hadn't seen Hodler's, whether he'd seen them in person. But then this is the, this is the big question about Thompson as well. Where did Thompson come from? And uh, one minute he's painting in, in greys, and then he's painting... In, in these dazzling colors, uh, in, in a completely different style. And it seems to have emerged out of conversations with Jackson and Harris, presumably. Um, but also, presumably, they were looking at Studio Magazine. and um, you know, Literally, I mean, looking at magazines and being in, influenced by what was happening in Europe. And it's very hard to judge to what extent. But I'd love to know what Katerina thinks of the Hodler connection. No. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you for a second because if I'm right, Victoria's told us that we've got to 11, which is five minutes. Oh, we've got to 11.15. Okay. I, I do want to make time for questions from the floor. Are there people with questions now? Would you raise your hand if you have them? Okay. Yes, Peter, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the European tradition of sketching. Can you tell us about that and how that compares to the Tom Thompson group? Well, yes, it's, I mean, I just think it's a different process. It's quite rare to find um, people out in, the, out in the field doing sketches over a period of time. We all know how it worked with, with Thompson and with, with, um, with the other artists as well. Thompson would be in Algonquin Park for as long as he possibly could from, from the breaking of the ice right to winter settling in. And during that time, he's not painting um, studio paintings, he's painting the sketches. That was, that was his art form during that period. And then at the end of that, he would go back to Toronto, hang all the sketches around the wall, uh, those that he didn't give away to any passing person who expressed an interest, infuriatingly. <laughs> Wish I had been there. Anyway, um, he hung them around the wall and then would choose which one would be strong enough to work up into a kind of exhibition piece. And it's very self-conscious. You can see that, for instance, in the West Wind and the Jack Pine, which were produced in the same winter and look like by two different artists. He's trying on styles at this point. Now, that process of doing sketches almost as a separate work of art and then choosing between them to build up into a final work is very different. In Europe, there's a tradition of sketching, but it's, it's, it's a part of a long process uh, towards the final work. So you have the final work in mind, you do your drawings, you, you go out, you sketch the various aspects you want, you work it up into a kind of modello, you'll do um, uh, perhaps chiaroscuro sketches to establish the light and all the rest of it, and then you work it up into the final painting. So there's a logical process. The end result is not in mind for most of those sketches done in Algonquin Park or elsewhere in Canada by the group of seven. They, they were just capturing, in an almost photographic way, they were capturing what they saw in front of them in terms of color and atmosphere and light. And then they would decide what to turn into a, into a final painting later. That's what's different. Am I right? Yeah, and hence we consider the sketches as really complete, final, standalone works of art here more so than in Europe. And Anna's essay in the catalog draws particularly on the way... Oh. Sorry, sorry. Anna's 
catalog essay draws particularly, I think, in a very sensitive way on, on the artistic strategies that were chosen to enhance um, and develop those particular, the individual works that really worked on light. You, know, you talk about the orange halo, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's quite a fascinating, the catalog, by the way, if you haven't read it, and I've only had an opportunity to look at it um, for a while, um, not, not in depth, it is very interesting from the particularly different perspectives that each of the curators and essayists has chosen to approach the work. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have the geographic, uh, but much more in terms of context, in terms of stylistic, in terms of zeitgeist, as Marietta said, not just stylistically, but also in terms of science and in terms of uh, spiritual and, and um, religious zeitgeist or the spiritual zeitgeist mm -hmm. at the time. And each of these issues is addressed sometimes in a slightly different way by the individual writers in the catalog. So it's quite a fascinating um, uh, overview of different perspectives again on the exhibition. It sounds like everybody's coming from exactly the same place, but in fact, as I read the catalog, I was struck by the fact that at least on paper, the issue of the uh, difference between the context in which your audiences would see the work or the context which you established within which the artists, the viewers would see the work uh, was, was somewhat different in each case, whether it was in Groningen. Um, yes, a question back there. Yeah. Well, one second so we can hear you. To the curator that, here, that is here from London, there is a video on the McMichael website and you're talking when you're in London. Now you did mention about West Wind not being complete and I'm wondering if you could, con if you could talk about that, comment on it. Outrageous. Um, I what an appalling thing for me to say. I'm sure it must have been a, an impersonator. Anyway, um, <laughs> no, it, there is a discussion there um, between, between um, obviously, you know, there's kind of uh, war uh, potentially breaking out between the AGO and the National Gallery anyway about uh, who has the greatest icon, and I think actually it's a tie. Let's call it a tie. <laughs> um, but it is so fascinating that um, this is part of what I was saying earlier. Uh, the idea of hanging the Jack Pan and the West Wind together um, on, on a wall, and at Dulwich they were literally sharing a wall. And the difference in technique is quite dramatic. Um, the, the, the Jack Pine is a very highly resolved painting. It, it, he's come at it from a, a cerebral point of view. It's really interesting. He's invented a, a way of painting in blocks of color, in, in stripes of color, all the way up, up the painting. It's very finished, very conceptually complete. The West Wind, on the other hand, is far more of a, a I would almost say, an impressionist or expressionist painting. With uh, It's setting out for a different thing. When you think about it, it's exactly the same subject. It's exactly the same subject, tree, lake, hills. That's it. But in the West Wind, it's about, it's about the activity of nature. It's about wind whistling through a landscape, whereas the Jack Pine is a monumental study of, of a tree in, in, in a kind of flat calm, as it were. Now, this discussion came up um, through curators from various museums, and one curator, certainly a very distinguished curator, who I shall remain nameless to protect the innocent and the guilty, um, <laughs> was of the opinion that the West Wind might have been unfinished. And I think, actually, the West Wind was the painting left on the easel when, when um, Thompson died. Am I right, if I invented that? And, uh, so I think there is a possibility. You can never tell, of course, as you couldn't ask him uh, whether it was finished or not. But it is certainly very different in technique. And it, at the, in the foreground, in particular, there are broad planes of color that when you compare with the Jack Pine, I mean, just stand in front of them yourself and, and make that comparison. It's really one of the great values of this show is to, to be able to compare those two. He's using flat planes of color that look less resolved. Now, whether that's a deliberate choice uh, or, or, that it, or whether it's unfinished, 
no one will ever know, but that's not going to stop people bickering about it. Are there other questions? Are there other questions from the floor? Okay, I have another question of you. You've talked about audience reception, but you have not spoken of critical reception. And I'd be interested in hearing, um, the Canadians have not had the opportunity to have much critical reception here yet, but um, I, I'd be interested in knowing about your experience and actually Marietta's experience as well with respect to um, how this was received. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very interesting. Um, I, I couldn't predict how the critics, which way the critics would jump uh, in, in England, but they in fact uh, did get it. They got it very strongly. There is one interesting element that is different. Everyone focused very much on Tom Thompson, and that, that probably is as it should have been because that was what I intended, frankly. So, so they, they did get that, and Tom Thompson was, was recognized as, a, as an extraordinary revelatory artist. Um, because the other names were less familiar, occasionally um, um, a particular painting would be picked out. MacDonald seemed to emerge quite very strongly from the show. But interestingly, at Dulwich, uh, we did something which you can see. I mean, uh, Katerina has, has done a very nice version of it here as well. We had a, a whole gallery, in, in our case, painted a really dark blue, lit differently from the rest of it, which I referred to as the Harris Chapel. And we had those beautiful Arctic and uh, um, uh, Rockies mountains scenes, all kind of pure and pristine and white and glorious in this room, and uh, tried in, in words of one syllable to, to explain to a British audience what theosophy was. And if anybody can tell me, I'd be delighted to learn. <laughs> it's far too difficult for me. But anyway, to my astonishment, Harris was the one artist that the, the British critics couldn't get. They didn't understand him at all. And in fact, two of them quite separately made the same reference. And um, please don't kill the messenger here. What they said was they remind, uh, Harris reminded them of Walt Disney. <laughs> now, coming, uh, you know, because of course I, as, a, as a, 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 a tremendous enthusiast for Canadian art, I was taken aback completely by this. But it did make the point that in fact, in England, we don't have the con context in which really to understand Harris. We just don't have it because, uh, as I say, landscape went in a very different direction in, towards surrealism. Um, and I don't think we have this great spiritual bond with the, the landscape. Frankly, because we don't have a big enough landscape. It's hard to thrill in front of a highland mountain. It's just not big enough. Our, our period of spiritual identification with the landscape was a century earlier with the picturesque and the sublime and people cowered under tiny rocks pretending they were about to be killed. And, um, <laughs> it, it, is just, it was an extraordinary way of responding to the landscape. But by the time that um, Harris is painting, we don't have anything to compare with it. And actually, when you think about Disney, if you think about Fantasia particularly, there's some great artists involved in Fantasia. Um, you know, Night on the What's It Mountain is Kai Nielsen, who is a very, very significant um, Scandinavian artist indeed, working in California. So maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> well, I, I wondered, Ian, if I can follow up on that. Uh, well, Britain obviously has a huge theatrical tradition, but and the crossover t between theater production, stage sets, and artistic practice in Canada was strong with the group. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that division was is, it wasn't welcomed by the British critics. They they wouldn't understand it again. They wouldn't have the the, the context in which to understand. But but you might also argue that the Brits were quicker to move into abstraction, and Harris was precluded by virtue of the environment in Toronto in particular, but in Canada more generally, from taking his work until he really left Canada in the early 30s. Um, you know, this was as close as he could get in a public forum to moving into abstraction. And those works really are caught between those two. And so, you know, ultimately it it's perhaps, sorry, a different environment with that, in that respect. Yes, and I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it all pans out differently depending on which artist is rising to the top at any given time. In England, you know, you have Nicholson, um, Ben Nicholson and, and uh, Henry Moore. Uh, 
transforming the way art is going. And before that, it had been kind of a realistic, a realist tradition. Um, Nicholson himself, of course, moves on very nicely from his glorious father, William Nicholson, who's now less famous but was a wonderful, um, lush, realist painter of still lives. Um, and the transformation from in the 30s uh, with, with Piper and, and, and Nicholson particularly and Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth into a, an abstract tradition is quite abrupt and quite modish in its way. It's a, it's a very abrupt and, and kind of advanced transition. Um, Harris, we can see now with hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, is moving towards abstraction in the sense that he's abstractifying his, his vision of, of these mountains and, and uh, icebergs. He's turning them into kind of abstract sculptures. Do, do you think that if you had uh, put Harris's work of um, the Arctic work and some of that uh, theatrical Lake Superior work, if I could call it that, against World War I British painting, they wouldn't have said that because those war paintings are theatrical. Yes. And actually, it's a very good point. I mean, there is a tradition. Again, it's kind of surrounding Augustus John, who does loom large in that period, but an, an artist who, would, who you could compare with Harris, I think, is Henry Lamb, uh, much uh, underestimated uh, British artist, glorious painter, um, who, who works in a similarly kind of abstracted way. Uh, but in a, a very figurative tradition. And that's the point, I think. Um, despite the British landscape tradition, the 20th century, I think, is, uh, before abstraction takes over, is, is quite a figurative, a figurative place to be. I, I have, okay, um, the question is whether I ask my last question, whether I ask my last question or you, I let you go, Katerina. I'll, I'll just tell you what the question was so you can all think about it and then I'm gonna let you go. I, I saw War Horse last night and I have to tell you that the only thing I could think of in the, in the war scenes and in the mud was Varley's war art. And I'm very interested, I mean, one of the questions I would ask the curators is the choice, the narrative that you chose to represent the group. Um, you know, you have the Jacksons, but, but on the other hand, it's, it's a relatively constricted narrative in terms of the evolution. You can only do so much, but I'd be very interested in hearing how those choices were made from a curatorial perspective. Okay. Why not? Well, I'll let Ian uh, finish the answer to that, but um, there were some, yeah, definitely, uh, Anna and I were a little more patriotic here in uh, saying, oh yes, how about the war art? How about Varley portraits and, and so on? And uh, the uh, additional members of the group rather than the original members. So I'll let uh, Ian address that issue. But what I wanted to say earlier with, in terms of the uh, connection with the British landscape tradition is that um, we often forget that Varley comes from a very prominent uh, uh, tradition of, of painters. John Varley was one of the well-respected uh, sort of 19th century uh, British landscape artists. He wrote a manual about uh, painting in watercolor is in landscape. So, uh, and you, you see how Varley deviated from that tradition, how completely changed and, and different he was, even though very proud of the tradition of his family. Um, and, and that is something that we, we also need to look in terms of who else came from Sheffield. There's Elizabeth Nutt, there's a number of, of Sheffield artists who also came at that same period with uh, Liz Moran Varley to Canada. Uh, but um, I, I said something on Thursday night when Ian and I were welcoming our members for the preview is that the uh, um, the entryway to the exhibition is something new that we're trying. We're actually uh, my curatorial department claimed other spaces, additional spaces, so we spilled in the lobby and our entryway to the exhibition now is a prominent almost Roman emperor kind of a, a triumph returning home. Um, and I dedicated that entryway to Ian uh, because what we did is um, we juxtaposed the 1924-25 press reviews that brought the group of seven members home as heroes after a major recognition in England then. And then on the opposite side, we have 2012 British reviews. So um, as you go through the spaces during your break, uh, you can muse through and see this kind of a mixture of lukewarm, 
very negative but also very positive praises for Thompson. And also we embedded um, archival photographs within the 1924-25 uh, critical press reviews with the photograph of the installation as well as the photograph of the jury at the time who selected the work. So here's back to our jury here. <laughs> Can I uh, perhaps uh, just go back to that, that idea about what, what, what was contained in the show? Um, anyone who organizes exhibitions uh, must realize it's, it's, it's showmanship. It, it really is. You have to control it. It's like writing a novel or making a film. Um, and uh, uh, believe me, I know how limited the selection was in, in one sense. There are none of my favorite Lauren Harris's are probably those wonderful um, town um, views, which uh, bliss, and also the very Scandinavian um, winter scenes that he did. Um, and I feel all of the artists were quite broad. I mean, obviously, Varley is a portraitist. And so when we started, of course, we, we had a... Um, doing this trans transatlantically is quite difficult, as you can imagine. And so there was Dropbox. There was a, there's an app for it. We had Dropbox full of all the images. And working down the selection to something that would work, uh, there comes a point where you have to realize you can't do everything. And also, that if, if you don't do anything, then there's a pretty good chance of doing another show later. <laughs> Thank, on that note, I'm going to say thank you to our panelists. Um, I've enjoyed, learned a lot, and I really want to thank you. And thank you for the exhibition, most of all. Thank you all for coming. And a, and a thank you to Joyce for uh, asking such pertinent questions. So thank you very much, panelists. And again, I'm going to add my own thanks to the co-curators as well as to Marietta.